Welcome back to another episode of a podcast run by a software engineer. I'm your host, Perry, and today, boy, are we lucky. Today, we've got Grace on the show. Grace, how are you? I'm great. Did you say that? Because, like, great kind of sounds like Grace at the end of the day. Absolutely like, not. <laughs> I mean, I keep on saying we're lucky because um, not only, of course, we got another software engineer on the show and everything, but your story behind it of the whole transition into tech, that's something that people want to hear about. That's something I want to hear about just because, like, everybody has a, has a story into the tech world. Yeah, even, even me introducing you, do you want to give a quick, like, 30 seconds in terms of, like, who Grace is and what you do day to day today? Yeah. I'm a software engineer at Notable. I have been working on the integrations team for a year and a half now, roughly. And um, before that, I was in operations for a year and a half. Right. One thing I do always love hearing from the guests and everything is just influences from like your childhood. Because I think like a lot of people, when they look back, they're like, this moment, obviously at that time you didn't realize that kind of shaped who you are today, but over the years, if you look back retrospectively, you'd be like, oh yeah, my dad was like super into Windows 95. And until today, like there was something that completely stuck with me. Mm-hmm. But let's say for Grace's childhood back then, do you remember any like technology influences or like more subconsciously, anything that uh, you remember vividly that could probably tell us more about who Grace is back then? Yeah, I mean, I was very lucky in that my dad was a massive nerd. And Although, like, for um, interesting reasons, my uh, my younger brother also was raised basically by the computer, I would say. <laughs> I remember, like, seeing him eat his breakfast every day at the computer, like, getting, like, cereal all over the, the like, original Apple, like, you know what I'm talking about, like, the, the big, chunky MacBook. And I, <laughs> But yeah, like, I just grew up in a household where, like, computers were just part of everything, um, which was, like, I guess, weird. It, it was definitely a luxury. I'll put it that way. Yeah. That, like, I mean, I grew up with it because my dad always pieced together, like, computers together. When we talk about luxury back then, it's because nowadays everybody has their own device. Everybody has their own phone and computer. And, like, pe- one single individual, one single kid will have multiple devices. Back then, I'm pretty sure the story is that, like, you probably had to share that with a lot of yeah. people. So since your brother was, like, having was the breakfast. He was kind of hogging the, the, <laughs> yeah. the, the, the house Mac. <laughs> right. So he was the one that was on it. So too. I was on Windows most of the time growing up. <laughs> playing Neopets and um oh my god don't get me started on the Neopets <laughs> and everything I remember was it sure you and all that <laughs> oh my god but oh yeah but the thing is like how how does that work because what I mean by how does that work is that like I remember back then we were three boys at least in my family and we had one family computer for the whole thing and we had to have like have like a rotation and like even going on MSN I remember you had to like log out of my MSN oh, yeah. and then somebody else had to log in so even just already knowing that you had a computer in your day-to-day life, like how did, you know, just more into details, like specifically, did you get a time to go on it? And when you were on it, what what was the things that you were looking at on the computer? <laughs> I mean, it, it wasn't anything, you know, super sophisticated. I think I was playing Age of Empires 2, like most like, of the time. age were you at this whole time? You made it sound like you were <laughs> there. There are like pictures three. of me four years old playing Age of Empires that I can look at and like show you. My dad was big into games and he would sh- like show us them. And so I, what I was mainly doing was gaming. Um, I, I think <laughs> that's the gateway to a lot of people to be fair though. <laughs> yeah. It's just funny that like you, you do get to remember a lot of these moments. So the game <laughs> I got shaped in is basically Diablo 1. So oh, like as far as I know. Amazing. When you're talking about cereal, funny enough though, I know in Montreal, which is where I was born and raised basically, um, we used to have these like cereals and inside they came with like a cd in it and like it would be some trial version of roller coaster tycoon where you could play for like 30 minutes before they kick you off and like i was just about to ask you was there anything like that when you grew up or is it just a complete random tangent in cereal boxes yeah i can't say i i would have definitely bought that cereal I know, yeah. I don't think we had that. If you're lucky, I, I, I might have a couple, <laughs> a couple of those lying around, yeah. so you might actually have those. That'd be really good. Well, I mean, great. I, had, I had that game. I had Roller Coaster Tycoon. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, I had, Sorry, you had the actual full version. We were just version. deprived on our end of having like the short, <laughs> short 30 minute version. I had Zoo version. Tycoon. I had Roller t- Coaster Tycoon. I had like this game where I was like a, a, a veterinarian for pets that I really loved. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I was like, yes, I'll put the ointment on the, on the fungal infection. I mean, those are the age of simulator, you know, like those are well before it's time and all that. Yeah. But what I actually, maybe I didn't even dive into this, like where, where's home for you? Where were you born and raised? Like, where'd you grow up? Like maybe that put a bit of context because like, at least I just put it out that I was born like really up north and really up east. Um, What was, yeah, what was that setting like? I mean, I grew up near Sacramento in California. It was pretty boring. (laughs) There was not a lot to do. It was pretty 
um, pretty suburban, I guess. Uh, there was like a movie theater in town, uh, not much else, shopping mall. But that's one of the, because right when you said sub, the word suburban, like that's one thing that I always think about is that like very similar in my setup. Like when we were in, in the middle of Montreal where there's like all the buildings. And I think because of that, that's where like maybe our parents got this thing where it's like, hey, let's look for something fun to do around it. And they would start picking up all these like weather computer gadgets and all that kind mm -hmm. of stuff. So I feel like there might be a trend if somebody like is out there doing these like, what are the odds like back then at least of somebody in these suburban area to have more computer electronics around it? Yeah. I think it's correlated as far as I know. So. Yeah, because kids need something to do and they're <laughs> yeah. not, you know, able to walk to something interesting. <laughs> like, yeah, honestly, I think looking back, it's easy, it's easy to say, oh, the parents, they tried to expose us to a lot of different, like, you know, passions, influences, and which is why it's one of the questions I love asking guests. And it's always great to hear that parents, at least, has a really big impact on that. By the time you get to school, actually, was there any, you know, tech influence, whether from your peers, whether from any teacher that would take their extra time to, like, have this little course of, like, hey, I want to teach, like, Java to little kids. Maybe not Java, but, like, <laughs> websites to little kids. There was really there was like one computer that the entire class shared I think when I was eight in my third grade class um, and then until then after that I don't think we had access to computers until I was like 11 and I've been and then like I think from 11 to like I don't know for the next few years it was pretty like rare access like you only had access to computers if you were in like a journalism class or like oh, well, yeah. some other like class where you like needed a like I took a class I, I want to say I like yeah I took oh it was meteorology I think we had like some like computer days or something because we were putting data in a spreadsheet for the weather that we were recording but like yeah it was it was so yeah we had some computer access but it was mainly just limited to like this is how you use word for your essay that is due or like this is how <laughs> <Do> right now <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah that you can yeah um or like things like that but like yeah we didn't have a lot on like a, a lot of stuff, basically. I remember, what is it, back then, I mean, one of the crazy things is, uh, yes, the very common situation of one computer per class. We would all share the computer, but everybody had their own floppy disk. <laughs> so the teacher would pull out this, like, massive boxes, like, maybe 30 deep of, like, floppy disks, and everybody would have their own, and you would save your little data on it. It would be like, it could fit probably two files on there. Amazing. And everybody just swapped in and out of that computer. So once you mentioned that, there's, like, one computer for everybody. I think that's so funny at the end, but... I'm always trying to bridge a gap in terms of like at what point you got the move into tech. Because funny enough though, if we go from that story of like the education system by that point, did you know that you were, you wanted to get into tech or like what did that scenery look like? It's funny because I actually, I had the opportunity. I was like a really, like an overachiever kind of kid. So one of the things I did was I took an evening um, like AP computer science class at like another high school. Um, and... It was a year-long class, and I so I had the opportunity to take that in high school, and it made me feel like I never ever wanted to be an engineer. Like that, it gave me such confidence and certainty that like I fucking hated computer science, <laughs> and like I just was never gonna be. I like even though I don't know, I just I just really found it extremely boring as a class, because um, all the exercises were just like it was like oh make um, it was like. I want to say it was Java. Um, it was like, oh, make um, Albert Einstein's eyes move as you click different points on a screen or like Whoa, something. Oh, that's really cool. What are you talking about? Was, I'm kidding. I'm it kidding. Was, <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Like everything was, it just, uh, I just found it really, really frustrating. Like just, um, and also I was just new to it. So I, I would get bugs and I'd be like, I don't understand this, this like error message at all. Like, what is this? Like no pointer exception or like, Oh, man, saying like, this as a, as a, what, 15, 16, 17 year old kid. <laughs> yeah, I'm like, like, I hate this. And I got an A plus in the class, but I hated it. Um, ironic, um, <laughs> given what you do today. Um. <laughs> yeah, no, so I, I, I absolutely hated it. I also did um, programming for our robotics team because um, I, but, but, but that's a very loose word. Like, basically, there was already a lot of, like, templated code out there for visual recognition um, of, like, targets um basically for like throwing frisbees at it was like first robotics i don't know if you're like you've heard of them but like yeah the like my my code my claim to fame on the robotics team that year was that i programmed our like visual recognition system um which like really was just me pairing with an in, like a 
a serious like adult engineer who like <laughs> showed me the template and like I just kind of tweaked it um so and without fully understanding like how everything was put together um and then of course another engineer plugged in like 15 volts to the five volt camera right before we had to bag the uh the robot so the camera blew up and my code was ultimately never used <laughs> really is that how it happened <laughs> yeah. oh my god so i just i was just like i hate coding i just want to like solder things and build things and like be a doctor i don't know like i just like i don't know do do things that are more like immediately gratifying um, right yeah yeah i think that was the that was the first time you ever <laughs> did something that went completely wrong i guess or like it's something that went completely like not what you expected or it was the only ap test that i didn't pass and i took 13 ap classes and oh wow I got yeah. most i like yeah i and i got a two on the computer science just a test. bad taste in your mouth but on also that point, it was like, like it, it might also it was like the, it was a multiple choice test like it, I, I don't know it was like it was kind of dumb I don't know but anyway I'm still I'm still a little bitter well that's what makes you because <laughs> the thing is like yeah you can say you're bitter about it but like if you remember it, it's because you'll probably not make the same mistake like <laughs> yeah. ever again I think that's how I would treat it at least that like yeah. if there's something that like over over the years of looking at it, it was like oh that one time like yeah I'll bet anything today I'll be more than confident to let you handle a lot of those cases because <laughs> you're not going to be making that same mistake but even being able because like as you were saying like using templates and like touching other people's code or whatever like you still need a certain level of understanding to be able to do that sure. and the sooner you get that like the more more beneficial yeah. it gets so fortunately like you got that well early in your life like yeah. for me like even even thinking about my like education like how long it took me to finally get a bit of like tech and coding into me I'm I'm very late bloomer like compared to this whole story so I'm just yeah I'm just happy to like being able to, to have a timeline and compare you know everybody's journey into tech at that point know. yeah I really I really feel like I didn't know anything I was just kind of getting by but yeah but <laughs> but yeah I was super lucky yeah like, well that's us every day today so <laughs> but funny enough though um did you end up going into any like computer programs during university I guess because yeah. that's uh, by that point like you have to make a decision right like everybody has well not everybody but most people end up making a decision after high school go into tag go into something else like what did what did you end up doing at that point yeah no I mean I like like I said like I was absolutely certain I never wanted to program again because <laughs> I was just having such a bad time uh, so I was like yeah I'm gonna be a doctor because like I have doctors my family and they were always kind of pushing me to do that and um, inspiring me to do that so I just yeah I was like yeah I want to I want to help people with medicine and so like I majored in neuroscience and I did that I um, took the MCAT and everything um, and like did spent a lot of time in clinics spent a lot of time working in, in with like other doctors um, and doing research like um, on brains and other things um, and uh, yeah during my gap year I was trying to get more more experience um, and that's how I ended up at Notable <laughs> like working at a tech company because I thought they were they were doing medical um, tech basically that was applying some of the stuff that I had clinical experience with and um, I thought that the whole concept made a ton of sense and was super exciting. Yeah. <laughs> it's so funny how you just put it so high level and so casual that like, <laughs> I feel like we just jumped over so many what? details on like how being actually what you do today. Because a lot of the stuff that you just went through like definitely contributes to like how you see code today or how you see like different problems mm. nowadays. So even the fact that like, one thing that I do remember when I was in university, I had a friend who was uh, on the path of going into med school and everything. So he was, I think he was majoring like biochemistry to begin with, but he would take a lot of like computer science classes on the side or like whether as a minor or something like that. Did you ever go anything like that? Were you just Never. purely focused of like uh, neurology and anything that is physiology oh. related or? I mean, for my major, I had to. And I was also interested in it, but yeah. So I took a lot of like neuroscience classes and um, especially, but I also had to take some like physiology, like a lot of physiology classes, um, which like I was super interested in. And so I loved them. Like I loved all of the stuff I was learning pretty much. Well, yeah, that absolutely flew by at that point. I, <laughs> it's just crazy to think, cause I did physiology for one semester and I couldn't stand it. Why? <laughs> like, it was, 
Funny enough, though, it's kind of the same, um, the same kind of your story about like looking at the AP tech and AP computer science kind of thing. But like from the other perspective, yeah. it was like you would do stuff, right? You would be end up touching projects, whatever. But then at some point, like it just doesn't go right. Like yeah, yeah. none of the results happen well. It's so and, like, unsatisfying. Yeah, there was nothing. And the <laughs> thing is, like, I wasn't confident enough by that point to be like, I know what I'm doing. Like, I genuinely did not know what I was doing during the whole time. So that's kind of mm-hmm. where I ended up doing the switch. But Fortunately, though, you went through the whole thing and uh, during the university phase, at least, and like that just kind of cruised through on that. And then, because the thing is, like, a lot of people, funny enough, when they say they, they transition to tech, it's because during university, they would be exposed to like Comp 101 or like Comp 202, which is like the very intro class to computer mm-hmm. science. And then that's when they learn about the for loops and everything. But <laughs> funny enough, though, you did have that covered. Well, yeah, you did a bit yeah, of Java right school. before then. So yeah. it's like Wait, lingering. I did a for loop in my life <laughs> in high you school. Know, funny enough, that's how it's it's terrible. Nobody quote me on this. But I actually, uh, that's the best time I've known when somebody got into tech is when they first learned about the for loop. Because like you could tell me about everything else about the whole thing. But it doesn't give me enough a, a good enough timeline of knowing when somebody first time, when they say like coding everything. like. Yeah. The day you learn about for loop is genuine, <laughs> like generally the day I would when consider you. begins. Yeah. <laughs> if there's a starting point, that's usually the starting point. So at least you got it way earlier. So in, in my story, at least it's way, way past that. But even in, in like all the health sciences aspect though, like I, I feel like that had an influence at least in my education. So I did the health science stuff. And like today, I definitely don't do any like health science things, but that definitely helped me in an aspect of like knowing how to break down stuff. Like knowing, for example, if you're talking about physiology, there's like different parts of the body and then different components of the body. So you know, like the bones, the muscles and all that kind of stuff. Do you ever think back of how, how that helps you today? Or do you just think that like, that was just something that you've done and like today there's nothing relatable between what you do in computer science to like, yeah. you know, on the path of being, being a doctor at that point? Um, I mean, specifically talking about physiology, I don't find myself thinking about like physiology in general, I guess, when I'm when I'm coding. Um, But I think that it did give me like the the impression that like, you know, knowledge is out there and then we and we can pursue it. I don't know, like I think it like just kind of taught me about like how to learn Um, and like especially like with like learning neuroscience, I think was a lot more impactful, like in helping me like inform the way that I learn things and the way that I think about learning, Um, just because it helped me understand, I don't know, just like how adaptable we are um, as like Mm -hmm. individuals and like how, yeah, uh, (laughs) like basically like, yeah, how, how like, even if you've had like bad experiences, like learning things, like, like, for example, like I, hated math hated math yeah. and like and um but like i think like after i went back and like learned more about like neuroscience and like learning i think that it helped me approach college level math differently because i thought like even though i had had bad experiences with math like previously it it um i guess like it I just knew that I needed to approach them differently, like approach like things that were different and not think of it as like, I am bad at this, but just that like, I have not successfully learned this in the past, but like, that's not, that's something that can change. Oh yeah. I think I could, I could agree to a certain point that like sometimes when you get into a problem like today, when you're doing, I need to solve this, but it's not obvious or like, you don't know the immediate answer to do it. Like there's a way to break it down. At the end of the day, like, whether you know it directly or you know a resource that helps you do it, like that's probably the more relatable part. And okay, fine. I give a lot of shtick to, <laughs> to universities over the years of like, this is not useful. Or, like this specific u- module yeah. is not useful. But I think like the methodology that they teach us is basically that, is that the problems, you gotta break them down. You gotta understand like fundamentally which part kind of things. And mm-hmm. I think at least for me, like that's a relatable part. Even though I did a bit of health sciences and physiology and math, like through education, like till today, those are probably the methodology I'll, I'll bring myself. But <laughs> at least academia, I'm not, I'm not going to be the most uh, correct person to be talking about that. But um, one thing that's so far, which is quite funny, is that like we still have yet to figure out the link between what you do today <laughs> and everything that we've <laughs> discovered all that. So I'm, I'm not like piecing the pieces together. But one thing that is actually quite cool is that you were definitely on your way to going to med school. Before you jump like past that topic real quickly is I'm always fascinated. Like what... What is the requirement? Like, I know it's not totally like tech specific. I know there's like very few subset of people out there that are 
capable of getting into med school and becoming a software engineer. Like, I, it's I a disagree very, strongly. It's a very small, I like, in my life, I know probably two people. And, like, that's basically <laughs> what it is. But before we dive into this, like, kind of overlap of two things, like, what, what was the requirement to get into med school? Or, like, how did you, I guess, did you ever apply to med school? Or did yeah, you? I applied. I got in. So what was the process? So it's you do a bachelor's and then you just apply? Or do you have to apply during your bachelor's? Or like, I'm just talking about the technical yeah. stuff because I have no idea yeah, no, how anybody um, gets into med school. I think a lot of med schools do require a bachelor's, but you can be in like your third year of college, for example, and apply. Like I chose to apply after I graduated because I wanted to get more clinical experience. It's typically recommended that you get I don't know, like deep clinical experience before you apply to med school or before you at least go to med school so that you can be more informed about like what you're getting yourself into, basically. Um, so, so yeah, that's, that's required um, clinical experience, or I guess a bachelor's degree, but you can study whatever you want, um, pretty much. I think I saw like, I was looking at a table of like majors at one point and I saw like anthropology majors had like the highest um, acceptance really? rate. <laughs> Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I just, I was interested in brains, so I studied brains, but like, you can study whatever you want, like, <laughs> brains. I, 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 yeah, I'm, I mean, just for various like personal reasons, but, um, but yeah, I, um, I like, you just, you really just have to study, um, some, some chemistry, some biology, um, I think some, some med schools require you to do some writing, um, some biochemistry, I mean, some labs. Like, there's, there's other stuff that's, like, that they like, but that, that's about it. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, those are all words that keep on traumatizing me till the day with, like, biochemistry. Like, honestly, I did not enjoy any of it. But I do get the the benefit, like the benefits of having that before going into med school because, like, it'll definitely give you a little bit yeah. of more context in terms of how you tackle that. Yeah. Um, also, years later, but big congrats on getting accepted to med school. I'm sure you've heard it a million times, but I think it's never a small feat to be able to do that. Um but when we talk about the clinical experience, so that's a path that you ended up taking. So you would do your degree and then you do a clinical experience. Yeah. I mean, I got some during my degree, but yeah, I felt like I needed more. Right. Yeah. The substantial, the like, you know, if you're going to be fully committed to that. So um, is that is that story after graduating university that you were you were just exploring there and be like, I'm going to get some more clinical experience and then get into med school or... Yeah. Did something happen during that time? Yeah, pretty much. I mean, I, um, yeah, I already, I was already in the process of applying to medical school while I was graduating, and I moved to San Francisco right after I graduated because, basically because of a boy, um, <laughs> and I, yeah, who I'm, you know, no longer with, but he just, he really wanted to go to San Francisco and um, work. I mean, he, he was graduating. He had no interest in um, doing like medicine or anything like that. He wanted to work in research. And so he found a job in the Bay Area. Um, and so we, we moved in. We moved to San Francisco as soon as I graduated. And I was like actually pretty excited to be near tech stuff because even though I hated computer science, I was still extremely excited by tech. So I found myself working at a tech startup slash medical practice called Forward um, as a scribe, where I was, it was kind of my first time experiencing like startup culture <laughs> and, um, and yeah. also just like also working um, at, like full time. And so it was quite an experience. Um, yeah. And it was also fully remote, which was weird because this was well before the pandemic. Yeah. Even, even back then, think about it. I'm sorry to ask, but like, you know, what university was it? Where do you rep? Oh, um, well, I started at UC San Diego, but I transferred to UC Davis. Yeah, th sorry, I should have just asked this to begin with because everybody has to <laughs> rep a university out there at the end of the day. But hey, you got a little yeah. bit of roots. But UC Davis definitely, uh, people definitely talk about it, especially in the Bay Area, and like it's always a uh, fun topic of conversation. I've, I mean, I'm pretty sure on another episode I was breaking down what does UC even stand for for the people listening that are not from the area. It's <laughs> University of California, and then they have a lot of different smaller, well, not smaller. They just have different campuses, like. Davis, Berkeley, SB, Santa Barbara, all the other fun ones out there. So um, the only way I knew this, because I ended up talking to a lot of people from, from California. UC. Yeah. Living in California, you'll do that. Basically, <laughs> everybody is one of those. But hey, that's where, you, you know, a lot of smart people come out of it. And I'm more than happy to be able to have them on the show to begin with. <laughs> um, but one of the things that, like, funny enough, when you go, when you talk about, like, going from UC Davis to the Bay Area, this is another topic that people love talking about, is that, a lot of people in the Bay Area, whether you do work in tech or not, you have this exposure to technology. You have this exposure to Silicon Valley and like 
not specifically mm -hmm. software, but just everything just about the yeah. Silicon Valley, the, the venture the capitalism, the billboards, <laughs> like you end up sucked yeah. into it, like whether you, you intentionally want it or not. So I think one of the things that we could definitely talk about is that like from your perspective at that time is that when you got into Bay Area, right when you were saying that, like just get exposed to, to different technologies, I felt the same way, like 100% right in the coming year, it's so much more present. You would, who was telling me this? Somebody's telling me that like the Melman will be talking about the merger between like, or like the acquisition of these like startups or whatever. I'm like, that is 100% true. So, but then um, one, of the, one of the fun things is that it's a logical path. When you're talking about going to, to Ford and working as a scribe at that point, mm -hmm. for the people not familiar super, what is a scribe or why do we need scribes to begin with? Well, they're basically people who reduce the documentation burden for doctors. So they take notes for the doctors. I mean, at, at Forward, we actually had quite a lot of power because their platform was awesome. I mean, I don't know, maybe, maybe um, <laughs> I don't know if other scribes got to do this, but like I got to start like putting in orders and referrals and I mean, ordering tests for patients like directly um, and the doctor would just have to check um, everything off. Um, I guess having not scribed anywhere else, I'm not sure if other people get to do that. But the cool thing was like the patient would get to see all of this on the screen happening. <laughs> yeah. like, some doctors would kind of say like, yeah, I, I think, I guess all of them would say that somebody was listening, but I think some doctors would kind of give patients the impression that like the things on the screen were being populated by like artificial intelligence. And like other, most doctors would not, <laughs> but, but, um, well, yeah, no, I feel, I don't, I, those were the early days, but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's I funny. felt like the man behind the, the, the curtains sometimes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> just like the one-way mirror kind of thing, like yeah. when you would get the full story on that. Yeah. But it's actually funny because this ties back directly to like all the professions we're naming that are in the Bay Area that are not directly related to tech, but ends up like, you know, being exposed and leveraging it. When you're talking about like the doctors that are mm -hmm. able to use like able to use the word artificial intelligence like that is yeah. it's a little bit like crazy to think about if you're not in the bay area like if you take some doctor I mean, on the, not disrespecting the midwest or whatever but like if you're going to be picking any random one it's very surprising to hear about this kind of stuff so yeah i was so excited to be doing that yeah and then like funny enough i still i'm still not able to bridge a gap between that what point you started coding <laughs> so, like, like coding professionally but yeah from that point you're doing a scribe uh, okay you... cut to cut to me six months in i've been working remotely but living in the big city for six months like and i went to their headquarters i went to their office which is in san francisco for my onboarding but like after that everything was remote so like me working six months remote in a new city where i have no friends except for you know this boy that i moved here with like I was going a little crazy <laughs> um you know i would see like a bird on the windowsill while i was working my like 12 hour days or whatever and i'd be like this is my coworker now <laughs> and i'd be so excited but like yeah so i basically was just realizing that my um i don't know i was i was hoping to meet more people <laughs> and like go outside more yeah um, so when i got a linkedin message from somebody at notable i was like oh this is cool they're doing basically what i do like note taking technology but with artificial intelligence that's cool um so yeah i, I was um, very intrigued no i mean <laughs> once people start talking about like automating what you do like or, like so stuff like that there's always a, a little peak of interest at yeah. that point and like this is this is something funny because like we obviously uh met at notable at that point which is why it's something absolutely great um, for the people that are not familiar, what is Notable Health, just to begin with, before we dive into the whole fascinating Oof. world of tech <laughs> meets healthcare? Well, now it is something very different. But back then, <laughs> what Notable was mainly working on was a platform for dictation. Um, although, you know, that has since become like, you know, a very small part of what we offer. But, but yeah, back then I was... Um, yeah, super excited because they, they were mainly involved with like processing physician dictations into an Apple Watch um, and turning them into notes that were uploaded into the medical record so that the doctors can, you know, just go from there. <laughs> yeah, and one of the funny parts is that like these are all terms that you're not unfamiliar with. These are all something that like yes. you definitely have embraced in the whole time. And you weren't hired as a software engineer at that time, were you? I know. <laughs> yeah. yeah, so this is, a, this is a fun day where it's like, so what did you start contributing as? It's funny. Like, I think at first I was just kind of correcting errors in the transcripts um, because, you know, sometimes, like, things would just get escalated to me when people, no one knew what a word was, and I would just do whatever it took to find out whatever that word was that the doctor just said. 
which, you know, it was very educational. I learned a lot of very niche words yeah. <laughs> and tests. Tell me about it. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. And then... And things just kind of changed dramatically very quickly <laughs> because, like, I was, like, the 17th or something, like, person there. Um, my job, like, was just... Like, I don't know, like, we also started to do more, like, like process automations and I would get involved in queuing, like certain processes that we were trying to like automate like like putting the notes into the medical record like how we were getting bots to do that um and yeah helping out when it wasn't yeah doing that. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not even surprised at that point because what happens that like of course you get exposed to technology because you have to work on the other end of it if yeah. ever something doesn't go well and everything one thing i just want to put a little asterisk on is that like the context of Notable Health, back then at least, like when we talk about the startup culture, is that like you do end up wearing multiple hats, which is why you get exposed to so many different parts of a system. Because yeah. the comparison is that like if you join like a much bigger company that are not in the startup phase, a lot of these concerns are siloed. Mm-hmm. Like if you were on the specific operations team, then you would just be worrying about the operations team. Or if you're specific yeah. on the support team, you wouldn't ever be exposed to any of these concerns that like, for example, the mm-hmm. engineers are like, hey, my, my technology is not working out tomorrow or like my system is down. Like you wouldn't be exposed to that. Absolutely. So it was just a, I guess like talking about knowledge that you already had and what you get exposed to in this like sort of environment. I think like sometimes when you look at that or at least retrospectively looking back at it, it's super coincidental <laughs> that like it's also worked out yeah. that way. No, I mean, I also happen to be so lucky to be sitting relatively close to engineers. And I think that was actually the biggest factor in why I became a software engineer was just because I made friends with them, some of them, and they told me I should do it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, I, and I was like, no, you know, I've done it. I, I don't really like coding. And they were like, you should do it. Well, that's the thing. It's funny enough because, like, for engineers, we, I mean, we, we would say just, like, stuff like that very casually. Yeah. Like, somebody would suggest me, like, yeah. oh, I'm just going to start building a second tower of Pisa. It's like, sure, do it. Like, <laughs> sure, you could definitely do that. But when you do hear the, the other bits of, like, oh, yeah, I should, I should try to get into the software engineer. I should try to get, just dabble, just, yeah. like, get into it. Like, at least I speak for myself, no matter what it's at. Like, these are just words that, like, I wish everybody has said at least once in their life. Like, yeah. Whether it's a soundboard to somebody or whether very fortunately you say that to other engineers that are like are just absolutely embracing these kind of these kind of moments, like I, I feel like it should be a more common thing. So this is do you think that was a moment that like just started kicking off your like transition into tech? Because the thing is like this leap that so many people find so mystifying and so, you know, impossible. What is the most relatable feeling you had at that time of like making this, you know? <sighs> I mean, really, like for me, the catalyst was just I I was running out of time to decide. Like I had already like I, I got convinced to defer my admission to medical school um, twice <laughs> by our CEO. And um, he um, just because like I was I don't know, I was persuaded that I was playing a very important role in ops. And I, I, I was. Um, but um, I don't know. It was just time to decide if I was going and and I was really taking a long hard look at like you know I'm like how happy I was to be working in the city how important the work that I was doing felt because you know being a doctor you're helping one person at a time but helping doctors like helping you know tons of doctors at once you're helping them help tons of people at a time so it's like orders of magnitude more effective um so I think like for me like yeah the biggest thing was just like like, well, like, I want to be a doctor to help people, but if I can just be good at helping doctors help people, then, like, I've achieved, you know, way more than, than I set out for, like, if I'm capable of it. So the pandemic ended up being, like, also another catalyst because I was basically stuck indoors anyway. Um, and so I started, you know, learning some JavaScript um, on the weekends and in the evenings because... Yeah, I was I was just at home and I was like, all right, well, now is the time to know, like if I'm going to med school or if I can code, like I better find out if I can code right now because it is time to go. Otherwise, yeah. I need to find a place to live like, at, the, at, the, at the med school. That's the thing. It's funny enough, like sometimes, you know, some people are fortunate to be in a position to be like deciding to get in tech and like when they want to decide to do it. But in yeah. your case, like you did have a lot of like circumstances around that made a lot of decisions at the end. And like, yeah. I mean, till today, I keep on saying that like, Seeing what you do today, I'm very happy with whatever you made the decision on at the end of the day. There's always some, you know, (laughs) I mean, there's always like, you know, grass is always green on the other side. But if you look at the bigger picture, there's always like tiny details that like you look back and it's like, oh, wow, it turned out that way. 
Um, one thing funny enough, though, I think years ago that like I, I remember you said this very clearly to me <laughs> is that like if if I do this, as in like if I stay at Notable and like just grow into here, is that you could help so many more people doing this than like mm -hmm. one individual at the time. Yeah. And like I don't think anybody else has put it in such a clear way that by the time I was working at Notable, like it didn't ring to me that like what you said was so true. Is that like I don't know if you intentionally said it in a very engineering way that like, hey, look, everything is so scalable. You could like, mm -hmm. why do we scale like one to one power when you could just like scale like exponential power yeah. and all that? But I think just the way it was very clear though the like nobody has had this clearness or conviction that yes, you could help so many people in a, in a much scalable way if you're in the right context. So I think back then that was one thing that I will 100% keep with me because <laughs> nobody has said it as often and as clearly as uh, as you did at that time. But one of the things that people actually really want to or at least I don't want to dive into people <laughs> speak for everybody over here is that the transition to tech. So you did mention that like you did have this time or like your own time to like figure out what kind of language you want to know, what kind of language you know, or if you're capable of knowing at that point. So if we look at like put a little bit more resolution into that is how does one start at that point to figure out if they know or don't know how to program at that bit? So Given that you um, you've you know you're in a position where it's like okay I'm gonna I gotta make a decision whether I go into med school whether I go into mm -hmm. that how did you start exploring to answer the question do I know how to code did you start with a class did you start with a course did you start with just talking to other engineers to give you a couple of like rundown like what did that first step I guess I mean, look like I knew that a lot of the engineers that I was working with came from boot camps so I figured I was also gonna do a boot camp because I mean I just I don't know, I just, I just, <laughs> I don't know, that, that seemed, it seemed to make a lot of sense. Um, so what I did was I just looked up like what it took to get into boot camps and I started doing that. So I basically did the, um, I think I did like Hack Reactors, like pre boot camp. like I just went through their exercises basically. Um, and like just with the goal of being ready to get into a boot camp not expecting anything else and like but along the way i was at the time working in kind of ml ops like overseeing like a lot of analysts that were generating data for a certain like ml pipeline and like through that i was interacting with like and always like i've still been like interacting with like, my friends and like some engineers and so like i, I don't know it just kind of like came up in conversation that like hey i've been you know doing some javascript i have this like I've been working on this cool project, like, and from there it just kind of turned into like um, somebody, like the engineer who was on the ML team that I was like helping do ops for was saying like, hey, you can actually help with some of our data processing, like already with what you know. <laughs> and uh, like after like I had just like I I had only done like you know. I don't know most of the prep for a boot camp like but not really yeah um, so I was like extremely lucky because I had you know the opportunity to just start doing like production code as somebody who was still learning um, and have it be looked over by like a senior engineer yeah and the thing is like it's I, I, I feel like I double emphasize that like a lot of times when you get into tech like you're not immediately making like your own project out of nowhere and like I'm integrated. <laughs> no, you're yeah. definitely like getting integrated as a, as a you know as a human individual you're getting integrated with the whole system and like I think that's what people maybe like misunderstand is that yeah. like sometimes when they think like when you join into tech like you're 100% thrown in there yeah like, you're gonna make like, a web app from scratch yeah or like a lot of times it's not <laughs> like that you get integrated that, like there's a lot of good systems out there that like they will know what you what you're good at because you were definitely good at a lot of things that are super useful and relatable to the engineering world at that time and then just being able to pick out like okay one step at a time we're not asking you to build everything and just contribute where you can contribute yeah. i think like you describing it that way should be way more resonating with a lot of people that are trying to get into it because that's probably one of the barriers that people kind of get scared about is that like yeah am i able to to contribute like 100 percent of it immediately you don't rarely happens like that a lot of times you contribute slowly piece by piece yeah like um, yeah i don't know like i feel like it was awesome that i came from ops because i had an understanding of the problem we were trying to solve that was actually pretty deep also from like my clinical experience like specifically i was working on formatting better like the medical like transcriptions that we were making so having spent you know years looking at medical transcripts by that point i had some you know i was able to just kind of make like a lot of tickets for myself just to like that were still like actually pretty impactful. So it kind of made up for me needing to get my hand held a lot <laughs> in some ways. 
But like <laughs> you having that to begin with is such a big boost. Like knowing the the at least the the terminology or like even the the, the space that you're heading into and adding code to or like adding engineering to, yeah. like that does it's... just grind a few years in ops. And... <laughs> <laughs> okay, maybe that's not the lesson. But... <laughs> if you have maybe. to. Yeah. <laughs> um, but one thing that you didn't mention that was really cool is that in the Bay Area, at least though, like boot camps are a thing. Like even okay, f- fair. Or across the world, it is New York, like London, even Montreal. Like people are starting starting to talk about these boot camps, and like fortunately, they put a lot of resources to help you prep for them. At the end of the day, mm-hmm. um, the prep that you did, though, if we, because like I feel like I keep on hearing about this, but what is the language at least that uh, the prep that they encourage you to do? Was it straight into JavaScript or was it something else? Because I know like a lot of people when they go into coding, they kind of have this decision of. Do I start with Java? Do I start with JavaScript? Do I start with Python? Do I start with Ruby? Yeah. Like, what was, I guess, what did you get into? And, like, did you have a choice back then? Zero thought went into it. I did JavaScript because (laughs) that was what the pre... (laughs) The requirement was, yeah. Yeah, the requirement was to get into Hack Reactor, which was the boot camp that, like, a lot of colleagues had gone to. So I just figured it was the best one. Yeah, and the best part, I, I love how you keep on mentioning that it's like the pre-boot camp, because like there's no it commitment. Was, it was not a boot camp. Yeah. yeah. You it, don't have to pay for it. And you, you can do it if you're like listening and you think that sounds cool. Do it. I think that's honestly the one bit, one bit that people like don't realize that like there's so much resource there that are geared towards putting yeah. you into a position like that. Of course, getting into boot camp is great and like you get the whole thing of, like as well. I came out saying like I do know a lot of people who did graduate from boot camps and they're doing absolutely great out there. Mm-hmm. But it's just funny that like sometimes nowadays we come on thinking about how we got into our first language and how, you know, how did I become a JavaScript engineer as opposed to like a yeah. Python engineer to begin with? Yeah. Like, I mean, are... they put me into Python when I was doing like production code. Like I was like, that was the last I saw of JavaScript. I feel yeah. like I barely, <laughs> I barely used JavaScript since then. I mean, I think now I'm doing more like TypeScript stuff finally. But like, but yeah, like. Yeah, it was awesome because the stuff transfers well across languages in general. You might have heard me say this over the years that like language is agnostic a lot of times. Like a lot of times, yeah. like when you work, I mean, sure, it's relevant if you know this, the technology that is relevant to the stack that mm-hmm. you're currently working on. Like, sure, if your project is based out of whatever TypeScript and React and blah blah, it's good to know those. But over the years, like as you know, as you work more in the event, not event industry side, the software engineering <laughs> industry. Um, you kind of realize that, like, sure, language is agnostic. The conceptual understanding, like the, I keep on saying the for loops, like, <laughs> those are, like, what, what I care about. Your but also how, butter. yeah, no matter what, <laughs> for loops is my thing. Um, but also how systems plug together, like, the system designs, like, a lot of those are language agnostic. So um, how, even timeline, people get slightly concerned about that. How long did it take you to go through the, uh, the period of prep? before going into a boot camp did you would you put that like a couple weeks only? before the pre-boot camp you mean? yeah yeah just I like did, i i just started with the pre-boot camp and how long did it take I you to go that, over the material that a is month. pre-boot? a month right of, of weekends and evenings yeah see and also like just the willingness this is the sheer willpower of like doing it on your off time as well to do that like yeah. it definitely contributes because uh not all funny enough you're not the first person i keep on hearing that like if you have the time if you manage to squeeze that extra like 30 minutes on your free time to do it like it's such a game changer long run because it definitely it's a compounding effect like that 30 minutes is going to give you so much more yeah. in the long run at that time but Absolutely. one month is not even that aggressive to me no. to be completely honest yeah. like given the the impact and the you know the following successes after like i think it's such a good time for people to think about that is there any other memorable thing that you remember during that initial phase of learning i guess this is more tech specific questions not only for loops <laughs> were there <laughs> Any other concepts during that time that you uh, you remember learning that is until today you are so glad that you encountered it while you were learning whatever JavaScript about that time. Oof. I mean, honestly, I find kind of the reverse. I wish that I had learned more. <laughs> I, I mean, mean, but don't we all? But like, I, I just feel like it's it was awesome to get kind of a surface like level understanding, but I didn't really grasp a lot of you know, the implications of like, I don't know, like writing clean code or like or how to how to make code that like people aren't going to need to refactor, like a lot of that stuff. Like, you know, I just I had to learn with experience um, and, you know, I'm still learning, but like it's just totally it was just totally like such an abstract concept for me, like the idea of like, you know, like how to write good code. Like I just I was learning how to write code and like that was what it taught me. 
Funny enough, though, I'm going to relate to this 100%. Um, because <laughs> the thing is, like, you were saying you learned this by, by experience of working, like, day in, day out and on the like, stack. Specifically and, like, specifically reviews from, you know, more senior engineers. Yeah, right? like, <laughs> they will tell you. Like, like, when like, I say experience, I mean, like, listening to them. <laughs> like, <laughs> actually react to it and actually, like, adapt to the whole thing. Because I keep on saying this. So, like, obviously, my, my journey is slightly different. Like, I went to comp sci, like, mm -hmm. more formal, more of the whole thing. But every point that you've mentioned before in terms of, like, what are good engineering practices? They don't really tell you the mm -hmm. practical day-to-day -day good engineering practices in school. Sure, you learn a lot about like um, how our databases actually build, like how does the indexing works on a database. Mm -hmm. Or for example, you would have other like um, validation courses that like here's you do white box testing versus black box testing. Sure, these are very conceptual things, but when you actually, yeah, I keep saying, when you jump into the industry, mm -hmm. When you're in the industry of like software engineering, you learn so many practices that are just rules that every engineer would know, but it's not really explicitly said during you know your studies at computer science or whatever. Mm -hmm. So I think you're fairly losing very little by the time you started like doing full time software engineering. Like I don't think you were losing that much knowledge just from the experience I've had. Is that like I've learned so much during the actual working. In software mm -hmm. engineering that like today a lot of my good engineering practices from other people that are doing en good engineering practices mm -hmm. and then if i need to backfill anything it's like i'll just find a book somewhere in the library yeah. that teaches me the how does concurrency work in different yeah. languages because that's mm -hmm. like super important just just that asks to anybody in tech you probably know this but concurrency is <laughs> super 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 big into that but um and there's always i just want to put the moment to just celebrate of course always being able to fully get into full-time Software engineering, it's full time tech. Because today you get to do full time, you yeah. know, day in, day out, first thing in the morning, and you get to like write code. I don't know if you write any code in the morning, but I'm assuming that you get to write <laughs> a lot more code as you go in that case. But um, one thing I just want to put in, uh, I guess, more of a higher level in that case is that what does the software engineering do? Like, we keep on saying, like, oh. a lot of people like very glorified, but the thing is, like, realistically, we don't code like 80% of the time no. or like we don't code like 50% of the time for example we have a lot of other responsibilities so yeah. if we just like reel back real quickly is that you've been through quite a journey so far like all the all the growing up already being exposed to technology but then kind of getting away from it a little bit but then coming back over the years kind of thing mm -hmm. if we look at your I guess day to day today what does what does the software engineering do it doesn't have to be specific to software engineering at Notable but like you know yeah. Grace as a software engineer what what, what does a, day a typical look like? day look like yeah <laughs> Ooh, um you know, there's, I think there's a lot of, a lot of everything, really. I mean, nowadays, what am I doing? I, I mean, I start, I start off with stand up, pretty much. Um, so, you know, I let, let people know what I did the previous day, what I'm going to do the next day, you know, the classic um, stuff. And I don't know, then I just um, try try and do it most of all, but there, I guess there's more to it than that. But like, you know, sometimes the things that I did are just, I don't know, like testing things over and over again. Like depending on the, the nature of the work that you're doing, testing might be very easy or it might be very difficult. And for me, a lot of the work I've been doing, testing is very time consuming. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, yeah, I can have entire days just going to tests. So not writing any code, just checking to see if it works. Or maybe just running tests over and over again to see why my code doesn't work. And then writing like, you know, maybe two lines in a day to <laughs> like, you know, net, net two lines after yeah. like a full day spent running tests over and over again. Um, or, you know, just hopping on a call, helping, helping a junior engineer or um, with something or someone or like, you know, talking through right now, like what I'm working on um, is involving a lot of like, like heavy planning and refactoring. I have not written code. Um, I mean, I guess I did finally start, but like, yeah, it was just days and days of planning and consulting and like making sure that like we are building the right thing because we are building, <laughs> we are refactoring this now because we did not really spend the same time and the same informed time when we built it the first time, basically. So it's just building things the right way is, takes a long time, but it's worth it. I yeah. guess. <laughs> Every, funny enough, all the points that you, you, you mentioned is that like, it goes back to the point of like the distribution of like what you spend time on. Like when we're talking about pure coding of actually contributing code, like it's, 
it ends up being like more minimal than most people yeah. think when you get into the when you get to do software engineering every single day. Yeah. And um and I can't stop emphasizing that testing is definitely good practice. <laughs> no matter who you are, where you are, like writing writing tests and like to be fair though, there's always an if more efficient way of contributing by adding tests and everything. So that mm-hmm. is like always different, you know, frameworks of doing tests, but even having the back of your mind that yes, the benefit of writing tests and the time you spend on doing it is definitely not wasted. Like, yeah, <laughs> there's gonna be so many things that you catch during that time that you don't want to see in production. So, yeah. um, I'm glad that at least that's some of the you know the exposure that you get day to day of seeing you know how software is developed most of the time. And what I keep on saying that like sometimes you'll be like at the end of the day you'll be like you contributed net two lines of code, but <laughs> many times like engineering like technical engineering leaders like they know how much effort was put into that two lines of code. Like I don't think there was ever a moment where like there's people that would have disdain of engineers that don't write enough lines of code because yeah. over the years of working in software engineering at least you know that like. Even two lines of codes is extremely valuable, especially the work that was put behind it to actually know to put these lines Which to begin two? with. Where? Yeah, that the work behind it. I I rarely have seen like technical engineering leaders that overlook that. Like a lot of people in you know in the industry would understand that. Um, but the other thing that I think might be interesting is that is this what you expected when you joined the. I guess the software engineering team full time is that because the thing is like everybody has their own expect expectation I guess before they actually commit full time of doing a role of software engineering. Yeah. Was there any surprises that you were like, oh, I didn't realize that like being a software engineering, you do this so much more than blah blah blah, or the opposite where oh, you don't really do this as much as I thought you were yeah. going to do being a software engineer. Um, I don't know. I guess like for me, like I it took me from the time I started coding like for the company. It took me, I think, another half a year or so to become a full-time engineer. I was still transitioning on ops and still, still learning and um, basically like j- finding new people to do the stuff that I was doing before. Um, and so I think it kind of gradually helped me get in and more and like know what I'm getting into as I was going. So by the time I was full-time, I kind of already was like, yeah, this is the stuff I've been doing half, like spending my half of my days like doing and I'm really excited to do this all day because it's, I don't know, it's like, I, I just don't, don't enjoy being in like meetings all day. <laughs> or half You don't? Day. <laughs> I'm kidding, I'm kidding. <laughs> yeah, um, but, um, but yeah, I guess the one thing that I think took a little longer for me to realize that surprised me about being an engineer was that the I guess like my biggest like obligations are like not are not as somebody who delivers like you know I don't know I guess I don't know it's hard for me to describe like it's like I used to think that the most important thing was getting through the tickets that I was assigned by the product team but now I'm understanding that sometimes it's more important to be like I don't know, especially coming from like, I, I, tra- I was in product operations for a while. So like, I don't know, just like product people were like my, my, my managers, like they were, I just did what they told me to do um, and, you know, gave them feedback and whatever. But like, I don't know, I guess now I'm like thinking more like an engineer and thinking more about like, like, how does this fit in with the rest of the platform? Does this make sense? Like, should we be doing this at all? Um, and like questions that I was just not asking at all as a junior engineer or like or as, as a beginning like engineer and not understanding as I was getting into it I used to think like yeah like I have to do whatever they say I need to do in, in the, whatever order they say and like not push like I just because because I was assuming that they knew best but I think now I'm understanding it's a collaboration <laughs> that's a lot <laughs> no I think like it's funny because over the years you get exposed to values of a company I don't know why I'm bringing this up but one of the common values that people think is that there's always a line about be curious or be be challenging in terms of question why things are like that. And that's yeah. 100% like, specifically at least when it's software engineering is that there's a point where you, you know, where, where you work, where you start doing this, where you start questioning, why are things like that? Why is it not more performant? Why, why did this, why was this decision made years ago and nobody has ever changed it? So I think like everything that you're saying was definitely related to some sort of those values that you're talking about that like, yeah. you always should be curious, you know, you always should be figuring out how to make it better at the end. And it's 
very cool to hear you say that it's more like a natural thing that comes up because like as you work in engineering that's usually something that people yeah. will have this moment of like yeah. oh look i mean sure they could tell you to be doing this thing but if you think about you know from another perspective the other side of the coin is there any benefits of doing it a different way you definitely get the more confidence of doing that yeah. as you know as anybody goes at that point and the best part is that like i know you at least and i know like a lot of people are like very willing to hear other opinions about it even though you get like you don't get the right immediate answer to begin with or you might you don't get the perfect solution to begin with you're more than happy to hear about why it's not the good solution and i think that's even more important like nobody's mm -hmm. expecting to get the first like the best solution immediately it's about being able to understand why it's not good and then iterating over that after so one thing that um it was probably not explicitly mentioned, but you might have gone through this quite a lot, is the pair programming at the end. Yes. Which is a concept that people may not hear within the tech world, I guess, but it's basically, um, if from your take, what, what is pair programming and how did that actually help you a lot throughout this whole transition of you know being a software engineer? So I guess pair programming is basically, to me, I don't know, this is not a dictionary definition, but I mean, to me, it's just like pairing up with another engineer and doing what you need to do <laughs> like whatever like i mean where i would use pair programming would be like where when i'm stuck or somebody else is stuck but it can also be when you're collaborating on something together like when you're working on a bigger project that you know where you're where you're going to need to be pretty coordinated it might be valuable to be to do that you know even if you're not stuck on anything necessarily um but yeah and uh it was absolutely like essential I guess like I would not be here if pair programming was not a thing I really think um, because um, yeah the the amount that I have learned from other people has been like enormous <laughs> um, of just like you know different things like domain knowledge like you know s specific to what I'm working on that you really can't get other any other way because it's not necessarily written down anywhere um, and then also just down to like basic coding, like, you know, principles, just like, you know, Syntax or... yeah, like, here's how you write that way better, <laughs> please. <laughs> Functional programming. <laughs> it's like, it's like, some people might throw it that way, but no, I actually do agree with the point when you're saying like, it's so crucial, like, especially from your point of view, but like, yeah. I think it's more like a two way street, no matter what is that, like, whether you're the driver or whether you're the, the backseat driver, as some people would call <laughs> yeah. it. Like both parties or even multiple parties when there is programming involved, like everybody benefits off of it. Yeah. As in like if you see code, because you're both writing technically the same code, but if you see code differently than another person, like mm -hmm. it's just more exposure to for both parties. I keep on saying is that like throughout the years of programming with people, I do know it definitely enhances my knowledge of seeing mm -hmm. why people see something differently. And I was like, oh, I didn't know you could, you could see it that way to begin yeah. with. So I think uh, for the people that do not embrace pair programming, start introducing <laughs> that more often. Or don't even like knew that was a concept to begin with. Because it did take me a while over the years of like working in software engineering to realize that like it's it should be more of a standard and like everybody should be doing that. So yeah. that is definitely one of the concepts that I underlined <laughs> to yeah. talk about. Well, <laughs> yeah, it made like is I really feel like if I had tried pair programming as like somebody in high school, you know, when I was learning to code, I think it would have changed my life. Um, I think I would not have been so discouraged, but for me, I was just like, I was, I felt like I was just in things alone. I had to figure things out alone and I was just going to like, cause that's how the class was kind of structured. Um, and yeah, I was, um, I would just get so overwhelmed. Um, and like when you're so early in your journey, it's really easy to get overwhelmed. Now I'm finding myself like, you know, I can struggle with things for longer without feeling like I'm a complete failure. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know what that what that means or how that feels, but we'll. Uh... I said longer. I didn't say it doesn't happen. <laughs> <laughs> we'll figure it out on the next episode on that one. But no, that's actually true. Is that like the timeliness, right? We're talking about timeliness when you need this help, when you need that. Like it's super useful that it makes such a big back, a big impact. Sorry, in the yeah. long run, at the end of the day, um, especially when people talk about onboarding. Like yes, put as much effort on the onboarding <laughs> yeah. because like right when you snowball, like that's the effect that you want at the end yeah. of the day. If somebody never snowballs, like you never want to see that. You don't like, you know, at least there's a lot of measures today when we're talking about onboarding people, like those are always something that uh, is beneficial. So, you know, always fun tech topic at the end of the day. One thing that, um, that I think is so cool that you do, and I don't know if many people do this, is that sometimes uh, it's not fully work-related, but it could also be work-related that if there's a tech topic that you're trying to, you know, get more knowledge off of like 
how it works or whatever, you would kind of go out of your way to find it. I think one of the examples, obviously, like doing these pre bootcamp thing is one of them. But what do you think about like these different meetups that happen, especially in the Bay Area, because it's like very, you know, Ooh. common to have tech meetups, like just tech meetups about here's this team that's going to present this stuff, or here's these meetups where you use a specific technology to, yeah. to build things, or whatever. Um, what, what's your take on meetups and how did, did that ever help you in terms of being an engineer? Oh, absolutely. I mean, they, they have, I wish that I had been getting more involved in these meetups sooner. Um, but yeah, I've, I've found myself in different like groups that really like motivated me and got me excited about learning more. Like, I mean, the, <laughs> like the biggest one I'm excited about right now and I just keep finding myself going into rabbit holes even just after one one evening of like of like talks and i'm and it was like weeks ago and i'm still like find myself like thinking so much about it and like do, reading so many papers and like i don't know just getting really invested it's just like the topic of like brain computer interfaces um like i don't know there's just but there's like there's a niche for everybody but like um but i just think that it's just awesome to find like if you like video games too like you can like you can find, you know, people who are, you know, applying really interesting code and like really interesting tech to video games. Like even like also that also applies to brain computer interfaces. <laughs> um, but like, but yeah, um, I don't know. Just like finding things that make you excited to keep learning and excited to keep staying in your field. Like, like I, I think for me, like I'm just so happy to know or to learn more about like ways that we can learn more about the brain and also like learn more about ourselves and also like just have experiences feel more immersive like all of those things are like topics that i'm really excited about and so it makes you know looking at things that would otherwise seem pretty dry like you know just like looking at some random like paper with like all these like waves and you're like why am i doing this like <laughs> you need to like i don't know like find maybe like maybe you need what you need to do is like find a community um uh, or find like a topic that interests you and then like get inspired by other people. That definitely helps. Like I'll, I'll put it that way. It's funny <laughs> yeah. how we also tie in the bow of like all the brain stuff again. Cause like, you know, <laughs> yeah. a bit Can't of study out there. And just, yeah, everything's a, everything's a cycle. Like, everything just like, comes back whether you want it or not. But it's also good that you mentioned that like when you're talking about stuff that is not fully related to work, there's always like the passion on the side and like everything that kind of drives you as you go, um, you know, Working in tech, sure, there's always this like glorified bit of like everybody's happy in it, but no, you got to do your own thing yeah. that always keeps you yeah. going. Whether, you know, whether, as you were saying, every time you meet somebody new, there's always new hobbies and interests. So even for myself over the years, I've picked up a lot of random hobbies that I think, I mean, this podcast to begin with, very random <laughs> hobby, but I do get to talk to a lot of very smart individuals. But on the side, as you were, t- as you were saying, probably like, um, I picked up the, the, the electric guitar a couple of years ago, like there's a lot of stuff. But for Grace's, like, you know, what makes you happy other than being a software engineer? I think that's probably one of the topics that people like talking about. Is there any anything else that not work related, not tech related, something that you're passionate about, something that you love contributing to whenever you do find a time to do so? I mean, you know me, so you know what I'm gonna say. Um, but um, and a lot of people who know me or know what I'm gonna say, um, it's probably gonna be motorcycles. <laughs> um, I'm just really um i i also started riding during the pandemic and i think it's also part of why i felt so like confident to be like become like an engineer too was just because like i didn't buy the motorcycle in like the best shape (laughs) or rather like it kept getting stolen so um there were a lot of mechanical issues with it that i did not really as as someone who was not a software engineer i did not really have the finances to afford repairs on so learning that i could um like ride not only ride but also like repair motorcycles made me feel like i could do pretty much anything after that which you know i don't know if that's true but like yeah anyway it's a very confidence building thing and um and you also like what i love about motorcycles is that you are instantly like part of a community when you are riding um people like people who ride will like be really invested in like talking to you generally and like and they're curious about, you know, what you're riding, where you came from, how long you've been riding. Like, everybody's going to ask you, like, these questions, like, when you sit down at, like, you know, around other bikers. And there are so many events for them. Um, and then, like, yeah, there are just uh, other other things that I'm really passionate about. But, um, 
but yeah, no, like, but yeah, I, I really love, um, I do really love motorcycles. Um, yeah. <laughs> it, you, you didn't say that enough. Just, for the, just, just for the record. It's just, though, it like, feels so good yeah. to be on a bike. Um, really. Um, just, yeah, I would, if you ever have a chance to like, it's like being on a bicycle, you know, it feels so good and joyful to be on a bicycle. It's just way better. Um, so anyway, um, I'm going to stop because it's, it's really hard to get me to stop talking about motorcycles no, 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 I think whenever I start. That's that's one thing about <laughs> like people is that no matter what, yes, of course you have like your day-to-day job or whatever, but like you're yeah. not just the, confined by, by being that. You always have a thing on the side and like, of course, you <laughs> will not shut up about motorcycle, which is a great thing. And over the years, of course, I got to run in, like ride, ride a couple motorcycles as well, but I will never be convinced that somebody needs more than one motorcycle. Yeah. And you will, be, you will be giving me a lot of shtick for this, but yeah. I know. <laughs> I, I will always fight you on that. <laughs> yeah. I think uh, it's always a fun topic is that like people are human at the end of the day self engineering or not like you do have to have your own passion at the end of the day uh, some people do code extra on the side sure I do that a lot as well yeah. but knowing that there's always an outlet uh, and also breaking out your problems your motorcycle problems into like self engineering problems like sometimes that's a really mm-hmm. fun, fun way of looking at that uh, just because you know Bikes can always break down, but there's always a way to fix it and then by the time you get through it uh, you get to do that so yeah um Unfortunately, I'm not going to ask you for all your hobbies because you have like 50 million of them. But I, what I could ask you is for the people that are getting themselves into this journey or like they want to get themselves into this journey. You know, when we're talking about like, I'm just looking back at all your story of not being in tech, but being fortunate enough to be in positions of being exposed to healthcare, being exposed to different technologies, being exposed to the Bay Area to begin with. A lot of factors put itself together so that you made this transition into tech like a little bit more seamless. But it's not easy. So for the people that are listening out there, what would Grace say to them in terms of like, if you want to get into tech, what is the best outlook? What is the best positive attitude uh, to be able to be confident and, you know, just embracing being a software engineer or transitioning into a software engineer? Yeah, I mean, I just, I really want people to know that they are so capable. Like, they are so much more capable than they realize um, in general. Like, I really think that, you know, I, I, it like kills me to hear people say like, I could never do that. Like, when I, tell them I'm an engineer because I'm like, I know you could. <laughs> like, I like, I really, I really feel that way. Um, because like at the end of the day, like the fundamentals, like, I don't know, you, you can, they, they, there is nothing, there's nothing special about it. Like no one, no one like woke up one day as like a software engineer. Like we all went through this. We all have felt like, like we might not be smart enough for this. <laughs> like all the time, maybe. Um, but um, but yeah, so I just, I really, I really want people to, if they have the opportunity to talk to other people who know how to code or like have friends who know how to code, like definitely like, you know, don't, don't be afraid to like reach out to them and like ask them you know, when you have questions. Because I think people are usually really excited to like talk about code actually, or like try and help. People generally want to help each other. Um, and I think, like, talking through your problems with somebody else, like, if you're stuck on something, is just immensely helpful. Um, and then it, it inspires you also to, like, you know, go back and, like, learn more things on your own, too, and just to keep making progress. Like, you feel like you have, you know, that kind of social, like, connection. It makes you feel like you want to do, I don't know, just, like, keep, keep getting better, keep improving, um, like, especially people are watching. <laughs> yeah. And funny enough, like I'm I'm just the worst one that after all you said all of that, the one thing that I love hearing you say is that we're not special. Like we're being engineers, not. we're not we're not special. Like. It's something that we just end up doing and <laughs> even hearing your story of getting into it, like it is a very step by step broken down process and it's definitely achievable from any point of view. We've have all our different walks of life and we all end up sorta in the same self yeah. engineering craziness and, world of yeah. everything. Like and we do stupid things still. Like it's we're just, you know, very careful <laughs> and like yeah. you know. We try to make environments where, you know, we are allowed to be stupid without catastrophic things happening. Yeah, um, we're, we're very careful after the 26th time. The 26th time <laughs> of failing something, so we'll, we'll end up learning our lessons. But no, I 100% relate to everything you've said so far, and I think those are definitely words that people should, you know, embrace at the end of the day. Make sure yeah. that if you think you can't do it, there's a lot of resources and more than people to, more than people out there to help you out on that. Yeah. Speaking of, though, is there anywhere people can follow you, Grace? Any, any social media you want to share with, uh, with the crowd? Oh, goodness. I mean, <laughs> I'm not really active. No, that's totally fine. I think <laughs> whether, whether oh, there's I'm a... I'm on LinkedIn. <laughs> I'm Grace Moore, um, notable, so you can probably find that. 
Yeah, as I keep on saying, like whether it's just for <laughs> tiny questions, I think most people are more than happy to hear about any questions, any concerns, and all that kind of stuff. So yeah, I'm so happy to help. <laughs> yeah. One other thing I, I do have to mention is uh, thank you, Grace, for being on the show. I think it's been an absolute great conversation. I, I keep on saying this, that like this podcast is the most selfish thing I'll ever do because I get to hear so many people talk about their stories and yours was definitely a lot more relatable than people think about. Anybody who could listen to this could definitely find some points of uh, inspiration and all that. So big, big, big thank you for being on the show, Grace. My pleasure. Thank you for having me. And I will catch you guys on the next one.